Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodeyer, the host for this program. And this is Open Line First Monday. For those of you on the other side of the world, it's also early Tuesday. But this is the program when we try and get as more of your phone calls and emails into the program. And so I invite back a former guest whose entire story you've heard. If you, if you haven't heard it, you can go to EWTN's website and either get the audio or order the video. But he's back to first share a little bit of his journey again, but also answer more of your questions. Our guest tonight is Jim Pinto. He's a former priest in the Anglican tradition. He's now the national coordinator of the Missionaries of Life, the Lay Association, and, and Jim will talk about that in a moment. But you're an important, essential part of this program tonight. So if you want to give us a call, you can do so at 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can call us at 205 271-2980 or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com Jim, welcome back. Oh, it's always good to be with you, Marcus, and with our viewers. And it's good to see you because this this thing that you're involved, this apostle you're involved with is yeah. new yes. since the last time we were on the program, yeah. right? Father Pavone has started the Missionaries of the Gospel of Life, has really built that on the foundation of Priests for Life, so we're now able to see raised up by God's grace deacons, priests who will do their uh, priesthood full-time, traveling the country, traveling the world. And there's a whole lay association now that goes along with that where people can take uh, similar promises, this ac exactly the same promises as a matter of fact, to mm -hmm. defend life, to do that in association with the missionaries of the gospel of life. And there's a whole pro-life spirituality that goes with it that's beautiful. So whatever work people are doing, in pro-life work. We're not looking to give them more work, but to support the work they're already doing yeah. and to do this uh, in a society set apart uh, by Mother Church. So if they see a pin like that in someone's Yeah, hotel. I'm proud of this pin here. This is uh, the pin I received when I made my promises. And it has a beautiful cross here. It has MEV for Missionaries of the Gospel of Life, has a crown of thorns for suffering, and has the uh, little baby's uh, feet. These yeah. are the actual size feet of a 10-week-old baby to remind us uh, what is going on, uh, the preciousness of human life, and that we've lost 47 million uh, yeah. babies to abortion. If they want to find out more about the program? If they want to find out more, they can uh, call us at 1-88-735-3448 or priestforlife.org slash missionary. We would love to hear from them. All right, great. So we got the commercial uh, part done. <laughs> Let's have a little uh, summary of your journey yeah. before we get into the questions. Well, I, I grew up in a town called North Bergen, New Jersey, which is just on the other side of the Hudson River. So it's kind of right in between the uh, George Washington Bridge and Lincoln Tunnel. So we grew up inside of uh, the Empire State Building, the World mm -hmm. Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it was, it was a good life. I was the youngest of four, uh, an Italian Catholic family. And uh, my father was a kind of a blue collar guy, a milkman. <laughs> and he did being a milkman so well, I thought it was the greatest thing on the face of the earth. <laughs> you know, we really do bring dignity to what we do. Um, and so I, I grew up at a time, uh, I was born in 55, and really a lot of my catechesis took place maybe 1966, 67, yeah. uh, just post uh, Vatican II. And Umane Vitae, I guess, just had come out at about 67, 68. And there was a lot of turmoil uh, in the church at that time. And uh, so we were a Catholic family um, and uh, pretty consistent, you know, with Mass and so on. But the, the church to me really seemed like uh, a TV without sound. Mm -hmm. And so there were all sorts of images and things going on where it was like watching a football game and you don't know who the players are. Mm -hmm. You don't know what it means to be a lineman or a running back or a defense or offense. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more kind of annoying if than to watch a football game if you don't know, you know, know what the players are about. And it's like Americans uh, watching rugby. You there know, you like, go. What is it? Right. Yeah. It was that kind of thing. You know, I think it was a real time where there was the signs and symbols were there. And of course, the church is always infallible. That's always mm -hmm. there. Uh, but we weren't really articulating, I don't think, mm -hmm. um, the Catholic faith. And so for me, it was kind of like being, being deaf, not being able to hear what was going on. And so, uh, you know, I did fall away from the church. And I, I'm a revert back yeah. uh, to the faith. Uh, and that was probably the first sin that I confessed when I, when I came back and made my confession, that I left the church, I take ownership for that. Uh, and yet having said that, um, uh, my catechetical training, I could you know, barely remember you know, what I learned there. 
and so I just didn't quite know exactly you know what was what was going on I experienced a radical conversion to Christ um, in about 1977 mm -hmm. uh, on a trip down to Alabama I was accompanying my wife Joy um, we were dating at the time we dated six years and we're married now almost 30 years we have four children eight beautiful uh, grandchildren and uh, we experienced a radical conversion. I mean, I was really searching regarding the meaning of life. I lost my mom at age five. She passed away. I lost my father when I was about 22 years old. And this was, you know, kind of hitting me when I was on the trip down to Alabama. And so uh, the key verse that I was struggling with was um, from the Gospel of St. John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So I was really wrestling with the divinity of, of Jesus. Was He really divine? Um, and finally came to the place where I, I really did believe that and Christ entered my life dramatically and I really experienced uh, amazing salvation and deliverance and healing and uh, so I, I just kind of made an association that probably wasn't a very good one and I thought well I didn't really hear much about this haven't experienced personal conversion within the Catholic faith you know maybe it's someplace else and that led me more on an evangelical course and journey um, and long story short uh, wound up uh, having a sense of call uh, to uh, Episcopal Seminary. Uh, went to Trinity Episcopal School for the Ministry in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, a wonderful mm. Anglican Evangelical Seminary. My bishop was Jack Spong, who's a very liberal a bishop in the Diocese of Newark. Oh, and I, I told him my conversion story and you know about meeting Jesus and about being delivered, uh, really, I, I believe, from demonic power and uh, going from an unchaste life to a chaste life and so on. And um, he said, I believe like you when I was a little boy, but I grew up. He said that to you? Yes. So with that encouragement, I went off to seminary. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah. wow. And so, but uh, he's, at least he's very upfront about what he believes and where he stands and so on. But I went off to mm -hmm. seminary and uh, went for three years without the blessing of a bishop, but was invited back down to Alabama uh, to a church here, Christ Episcopal Church in Fairfield, mm -hmm. and worked as a, as a layman, as a deacon, then as a priest, and wound up with that congregation uh, for 18 years in the Episcopal Church, and then we made a move to the Charismatic Episcopal Church, which is still in kind of an Anglican tradition. And so it was 22 years totally of being a part of that parish. I loved the parish work, great you know, people, people very involved in inner city ministry, racial reconciliation, pro-life work, and, uh, but uh, the Lord began to draw me back, draw me back, calling me back home, and uh, made a trip to Rome with my wife, uh, Joy, and that really sealed the deal for us, spending nine days in Rome, visiting the basilicas, going to the tomb of St. Peter and St. Paul, and saying, hey, this is the locus of authority here, and, uh, and just had to come back. Shared with my bishop here in Alabama, and I said, you know, I desire to and must bend my knee to the Pope of Rome. And he said, what are we going to do? This ain't Rome. <laughs> <No. laughs> so I saw 22 years of ministry just burning up in front of my eyes. And I had about 10 days to leave my parish after 22 years. Wow. And so I shared with my parish on that last Sunday, shared with them as best I could, you know, why I was doing what I was doing, told them I loved them, and uh, played a song, uh, the last song, as I prepared to leave. And some of the words to that were, when it's all been said and done, there's only one thing that really matters. Did I do my best to live the truth? Did I live my life for you? And I tried to say, that's what I'm about. And I laid down my chasuble, uh, my alb, my, uh, my uh, collar, my uh, clergy shirt. And that was about as far as I went. <laughs> but that was all the priestly garb. And uh, people were weeping in that church. Yeah. I mean, they were weeping. Men were weeping. And my wife, Joy, came up and uh, clothed me the way I'm dressed now. Mm -hmm. And I went and made my first uh, confession at a Catholic church for some over 30 years. And Joy said, well, I'll have a nice lunch for you when you come home. And I said, well, make it supper. It's been 30 years. <laughs> and so bless that priest. Already heard my confession. Came back into the church and uh, been working with uh, Priests for Life, Missionaries of the Gospel of Life, working at a local crisis pregnancy center. My wife and I do life, marriage, and family work. And so we're getting on with proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Catholic context, and it's absolutely wonderful. When you laid down your, your priestly garments, did you know what what you were going to do that next day? I mean, did you already have it worked out yet? Or? Um, there was, you know, I, I did have some, I didn't know what I was going to do financially exactly, yeah. but yeah, I've been speaking with Father Pavone for some time. Right. I've known him for like uh, 13 years now. Because your pro-life commitment. Pro-life commitment, yeah. we work together, yeah. and he said, look, you know, you've got a job, you know, with us. Um, and then I knew that Joe and I d would do marriage and family work. Um, so it wasn't all together, but the, right. there was some pre-planning. Yeah. And but we, you know, we did step out in faith, and uh, you know, God has really caught us, 
And uh, but you know, you got to make peace with yourself. It is difficult, though. I mean, in definitely, I work with the Coming Home Network International, and our job is always helping right. clergy on the journey. That's what we do. And even when you think you've got a pretty good idea, which it's yeah. it's rough, right? Because there was that ordination, yeah. there was the preaching, yeah. there was yeah. the counseling, oh. there was yeah. you know, it's hard to oh, it's to move on. And, and you know, the old Yiddish saying, you know, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plan. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> this is my plan. But yeah, oh, it's painful. I mean, it, it is akin to uh, you know, really loss, uh, lamenting, mourning, death. And you have to go through those stages and phases, yep. and you know your ministry is just so critical. Well, a lot of who you think of who you are is connected with that. It's really wrapped up done. in there. So yeah, you've got to do a lot of sorting out, but it also brings you back to your first love, you know, yeah, because you have to come back to the point where you say, "What's the ultimate thing in my life?" And for me, I had to answer that question, and it's being a child of God, it's being the bride of Christ, and it's being able to be in the Catholic Church and receive the sacraments and die within the Church. Take a step back. You're a reaver. You know, right. You brought up, left, came back. As you look back, what was missing? I mean, yeah. what? Uh, yeah. Why didn't you get it? Yeah. You know, I've, I've been thinking about that, and you know, I was on here before two years ago, and I had a little different story. But uh, you know what, what the problem was? I wasn't converted. Hmm. That's the problem, and that's a big problem <laughs> for somebody personally. Right. And I think it's, it's. What uh, could have converted you? I mean, as you look back, what was what, what didn't been? convert you? I mean. What could have converted? Where do you point the fingers? Well, I mean, of course I was <laughs> baptized, so right. I really believe I was grace. born again by water and, and baptism right. that I'm born again. I mean, I believe that. But that does not negate the fact of a personal conversion. And that at least at the time I was in, and I think it's changed. I, I'm very encouraged by what yeah. I see in the Catholic Church. Um, but what, what could have happened was for somebody to share with you, uh, like I've shared now, even when I left the church, I had a nephew who was going to make confirmation. And I shared with him, do you know what confirmation is about? You know? And he was saying, like, no, I really don't know what it's about. So I said, well, let me tell you what it's about. This is your time, like the Jews were bar, mitz, uh, bar mitzvahed, mm -hmm. and where you own the law, you own the Torah. You have to appropriate relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ has kissed you in baptism. You have to kiss him back. You need to give your heart to him. Open up your heart. Let the gift of uh, baptism be stirred up. So somebody to talk with you, and this is where, where the evangelicals got it right. They understand the charisma. You know, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has come in, again, repent and believe the gospel. That's Catholic. Yeah. And, you know, at different, we're here 2,000 years, so it ebbs and flows, that personal call to conversion. Mm -hmm. But I needed personal conversion because it really opens up your eyes. So I think that was key. And I needed to understand who the players are on the field. You know, yeah. who is the Pope? Who is Peter? You what is that? You through a difficult time where a lot of people were guessing what's going to happen, what's going to change. Some people were out guessing the church, jumping oh. way far ahead yeah. and jumped way off the bandwagon. And you were in that difficult time. I think for you, you look back on confirmation was the way you understood it more of a rite of passage at the time for as me, opposed you know, to a, a confirmation mm -hmm. of what your Yeah, no, meant. there really was not much dialogue, sharing, explanation. You know, how will you know without a preacher? I mean, to really share. And it was kind of like being uh, Helen Keller, you know? Mm. And uh, she was just being directed around and placed here and there and this and that. But Ann Sullivan, who was trying to reach her, was saying, this is not enough. She's a human being. She needs to understand. She needs to be able to communicate. We need to let her know what's going on and what things yeah. are. You see, and that's the work of a preacher. That's part of the work of a priest and the work of our catechists. And uh, that was desperately, I think, what I mm. needed. All right. We have a caller, Jim from Ohio. Hello, Jim. What's your question tonight? Well, I was raised Roman Catholic, and um, I believe in God. I accept Christ as my Savior. And um, But I've been doing some scripture reading, and uh, one of the things that makes me question the church um, is in Matthew 23, 9, Christ said, Call no man on earth Father, mm -hmm. for you have one Father, and he is in heaven. So why do you refer to a Catholic priest as father? First, Jim, let me thank you for that question because it's a question a lot of people have. It's a lot that comes up often. Right. So it's a good question. Thank you, Jim, and our prayers are with you in your own journey. Well, I, I think a passage that comes to mind, uh, and hopefully you're looking it up, right. um, is, you know, um, St. Paul says to Timothy, you know, you don't have many fathers in the faith. So evidently St. Paul uses the term father. And uh, I think uh, when Jesus is speaking about, you know, call no man father, uh, I really think he's speaking in what's called hyperbole, kind of exaggeration, trying to make a point that compared, compared to God, you know, the, it's like not having a father. He also said, 
you know, he who loves father or mother, sister or brother more than me is not worthy of me. And uh, your relationship with your mother and father should be as hate. And, well, is that really what he means? He doesn't want us to hate our parents. But in comparison, uh, that's what we're speaking about. And then the other issue is if we don't call anybody father, why do we call our father's father? I mean, you know, because we do. Why do we have Father's Day? You know? And so we really do use the term father. And I think that's just some confusion about the text. If we take everything literally, there are texts that should be taken yeah. literally. There are texts that, that are figurative. There are texts where there's hyperbole. And this is, this is where the church comes in to explain In fact, things. if we expand around that text, you don't have your reading glass either. <laughs> um, that, well, first of all, Jim, we're not belittling your question at all. No, because we're, it's a good it. question because what you want is you want to take the word seriously. And we as Catholics agree with and you completely. Yeah. The context, though, is that's verse 9, but verse 8, but you are not to be called rabbi. For you have good one point. teacher and you are all brethren. And then verse 10 afterwards, neither be called masters, for you have one master in Christ. And it, the, Jim makes the, a great point, and that is that Jesus used hyperbole, and I think he used it a lot more than we always point out. Yesterday's gospel was about plucking out your eye and cutting off your hand. And, I mean, that's literally what he says. Well, it's easy, and I remember when I was a Protestant minister, I said he's speaking hyperbole. But there are lots of other places like uh, when he's criticizing uh, people showing their piety in public for the sake of the public, and he says, instead, go into your closet and close right. your door. Well, there's a little hyperbole there. He did not mean literally the only place we should pray right. is in our closet. Yeah. And the, a lot of the places in Scripture where people take literally, even against the church, often it's hyperbole. Right. Jesus is trying to awaken his audience. You're an example is that you came up through the conveyor belt. Right. You needed some to awaken you right. to really what it was about. A little hyperbole might have awakened you up. You know, either yeah. you were going to cut that hand off because of what you did there right. to get your attention. That's yeah. what he's trying to do in this right. context. Let's take our next email. Joseph from Ohio. Marcus and James, welcome home. When the Charismatic Episcopal Church was founded, why was it decided that an altogether new denomination should be started? I understand that for many entering the Roman Catholic Church is not easy, but a lot of times <coughs> folks who see a need for seven sacraments and episcopacy will go to other churches and ecclesial communities like the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Reformed Episcopal Church, etc. Thanks, Joseph, for your email. Yeah. You know, I think uh, there's always in our hearts this idea that we could just do it somehow better. <laughs> and I think the Charismatic Episcopal Church, I think it's, you know, its founders are really filled with genuine men that were really seeking truth and so they believed in a convergence so they were evangelicals so they believe in that stream of declaring the gospel the authority of, of scriptures they're Pentecostal believe in that Holy Spirit experience and then they started studying church history began to look into apostolic succession and sacraments and so on and so looking through their glasses uh, they really saw this kind of three streams movement and that this is something that could really unify people that could speak best and they just went with it that way and uh, instead of understanding now that I look back on it yeah. you know I left the Catholic Church to some degree because I became you know charismatic and I've come back because I'm charismatic <laughs> because it is the Roman Catholic Church the Church of Rome that has the charism of authority and that's what I saw that the Episcopal Church doesn't have that charism of authority mm. the CEC doesn't and the other denominations do not have that charism and it becomes very very painful to try and move in authority when you really don't have that charism and many other charisms of, of, of preaching and teaching and and so on but uh, there's only one church that really has that overarching charism that teaching authority that infallibility and that is the Church of Rome to rest your life on yes I mean that's the key you know, we, we got all kinds of decisions in life where we're trusting the authority of a banker or of an architect or something. Absolutely. But that's a, a short-term decision in terms of eternity. Absolutely. And, and, you know, that's one of the key reasons why I came back, not only for myself, but, you know, the older I get, I want to be able to say to my children, look, this, the best I understand, this is the church with the most authority. It has the Bible with all the books in it. We need all the books in it. And uh, wherever you go in the world, there'll be a church there. And uh, this is the best I can do for you. And I think I can lay down my head and rest because it's life and death for me and for my family. All right. Thank you, John. Let's take our next caller, Aaron from Michigan. Hello. What's your question tonight? Hello. Uh, my question is I'm interested in converting to Catholicism, but the local church around here is 
very apathetic and very they always keep referring to themselves as the Vatican II Church, and they don't really stress, you know, Christ physically present in the Eucharist or the Rosary or any of the great devotions of Roman Catholicism. Yes. That, and they don't take criticism very well. Oh. So, <laughs> any advice? <laughs> well, guard your criticism uh, if you want to survive for a moment. But, Aaron, thanks for your question. What's your thought? I mean, uh, he, he's making a great point. I mean, one of the reasons the Coming Home Network exists well. is because... <laughs> There are clergy that want to come in, and then they get advice not to come in. Or there's Aaron, or he goes to a local church, or like he says, they don't take criticism very well. But yeah. Well, I wonder if it, it might be. First of all, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, I can remember saying to my family as I was departing uh, the Episcopal Church, and I was saying, "Look, we're not going into the Catholic Church because there's nicer people, uh, because they're you know doing everything right. You'll probably meet more people that aren't following or are hypocritical and so on." And I'm not saying that's exactly what's going on in his church. My kids said, "Well, why are we leaving if there are more people over there not doing it?" Yeah. Says because there's a billion of them. There's a billion people there. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, he might want to contact the diocese and he might want to say, uh, you know, who he is and kind of his leanings and what's going on and that he's considering really converting. And they, they may know, because uh, there are some churches and some pastors that really are more sensitive to this. Uh, there are a number of pastors who themselves were Anglican uh, priests or from different denominations. Uh, he could also, you know, touch base with the Coming Home Network or he can, you know, get in touch with me and, and my email should be online. They're missionaries at priestforlife.org. We may know people in your right. in your area that you can have some fellowship with that can guide and direct you. We actually host a little group in my house where people come and they share. They say, "Look, I really would like to come in, but I don't know where to go here. I don't know who the players are. I don't know what's going on. What are the churches? How do I get involved?" And uh, maybe we can help them out to get in contact with people in his area. Yeah, I'm going uh, to give a, a bit of advice, but I'm a little nervous of it uh, of getting overinterpreted because I'm not really a proponent of church shopping right okay right. and I'm not saying I'm not guilty of that at times in my own life because I get upset with what's happening at a parish and okay. but also sometimes you, you have to do that sadly uh, and so I know from where you mentioned you were calling from that I know of good parishes right. in your area uh, so you've got to look around a little bit uh, and then when you're stronger in the faith then you can return to that church that's struggling that might need a, an on-fire layman like yourself to be involved to help with renewal. You know, so. Call us back when it happens. That's right. We'd love to hear it. Love to hear it. Let's take uh, this email from Christy. Hi, Marcus and James. I was approached by a friend who is from the Episcopal Church, and she said that the only difference between the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church is that we worship Mary. Please explain what is taught by the Episcopal Church about Mary. Thanks, Christy. <laughs> well, wow, what a question. Uh, there are numerous differences, and certainly well, for the one, we worship, don't worship of Mary, Mary. Is, is, not, <laughs> is not one of them. That's right. Uh, yeah, so Because I've known Anglicans that pray the rosary and have great devotion to right. Mary. So, and so there, there's a, what Anglicanism is at this point, I mean, I don't think Anglicanism really knows. So there's yeah. so many different streams and mm -hmm. things that are going on, on within that. Uh, but I often have people, not often, but well, maybe it is often, say to me, you know, that they're so similar and so on. And, and so, w and it, it's Catholics sometimes that say, well, well, the Episcopal Church and the Catholic Church are just so close and so on. So I said, well, you know, if they were, I wouldn't have left. Yeah. You know, so they're not really that close. They don't submit to the authority of the Holy Father. The whole thing of apostolic succession, you know, is really under question. If you want to believe in the real presence of Jesus, you can in the Episcopal Church. If you don't, it's just a spiritual presence, you can believe that. If you want to believe, although it's getting harder now, uh, you know, to believe uh, that uh, it should be a male priesthood, it was a time you could believe that. You can't now. I mean, you have right. to submit and have the ordination of, of women and practicing homosexuals and so on. So there's a lot of fine people, a lot of great things. I will great debt to the Episcopal Church. Yeah. But there are many, many differences, and the worship of Mary is not one of them. Of course, we venerate Mary. Uh, love Mary. Mary is the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, mother of the Divine One. And uh, I think uh, I there is a, a great appreciation for Mary overall in the Episcopal Church. Right. We need to pray for our Episcopalian brothers and sisters going through right. a difficult time. Yes, indeed. You know, they, they, they need to, and that they would hear the fullness. I mean, that's our, right. our goal and pray for that. Yeah. All right, let's go to Beth in Pennsylvania. Hello, what's your question? Hi. Thanks for accepting my question. I'm calling f uh, about our son, Anthony. He was raised in the faith, and when he got into adolescence, he became addicted with drugs. 
I'm pleased to say he's overcome that and he's back in the church and he's praying but he's just going through the motions. He doesn't really seem to get it. And I, I heard you mention that you kind of went through the same experience. How can we help him to really get it in his heart and his life? Thank you very much, Beth, for your call. Mm. Well, I don't know how complicated the issue is or how deeply he's involved you know, with, with alcohol or with any kind of drug or anything like that. And I think it's very important just to get him with, you know, sh share with him, love him. This is a great time to love him unconditionally but there needs to be boundaries around him. So there may be issues, just personal issues and what he's going through that could really hinder him from hearing you know, what's going on. So I think a really good counselor, people that work in this area would be very important uh, to have around him. Um, and uh, you know, get associated with a church that has a good, good youth group in it, some good youth leaders in it. I think there's a group called Teen Life, which is really super. I was just involved with them uh, down in Tampa. That's a great group. Uh, but just love on him, listen to his heart, get with people that are really uh, you know, in tune with what's going on with him because you can't cut any edges with the mm -hmm. drug and alcohol problem and, uh, and he has to know that you're really there with him and that you're going to hold him to account as well as loving him tenderly. I think those things are, are really critical. All right, thanks James. All right, let's take uh, this email. Looks like this is from Trisha. I think they're still working on it there, but I think it's ready for us in Newark, Ohio. Near my, where my home, not, not far from, uh, actually I used to be a pastor in Newark, Ohio. Uh, dear Marcus and Jim, uh, I have heard many of your guests comment that in their journey, they never had any Catholics evangelize to them. I think I've said to that. Uh, I, strong, I struggle with the idea of when are we evangelizing and when are we just playing Bible tennis to prove a point in our discussion with non-Catholics? Ooh, good question. Cecilia, Tricia, fine email. Question is, okay. I mean, we've made that comment that yeah. we've, no one evangelized us from the yeah. Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we evangelize? Yeah. Um, for me, I mean, I, I just looked up on a website and they gave 10 different ways to evangelize and so on. How do we evangelize okay. as Catholics? Mm -hmm. But, you know, f I'm just going to go where I'm, I'm from, okay? And, and with, with so many Catholics, I think that one of the key things, we don't pray with one another spontaneously. Very, very rare. And I love praying the rosary, the chapel of divine mercy, and, and so on. That's really good. But very rarely do we just stop. Uh, I'm talking about evangelization yeah. with Catholics, uh, you know, and just to say, can we pray and in, invite more fully the Lord's presence or just, just receive him more fully or stir up our baptism, our confirmation, or can I pray with you as a couple? And uh, do you understand that uh, Jesus desires for you, so to speak, to, to kiss him back, to respond to him? And, and I think this is where the church is getting stronger and stronger. But I can remember as a kid growing up in the Catholic Church looking at the crucifix of Christ and just looking up and looking up for Mass after Mass and saying, how do you get in here. Now he was already there through baptism, mm -hmm. through communion, but all that wasn't explained very well, but he mm -hmm. was there. But, but see, this was getting to appropriation. This was getting to faith. This was getting to trust. This was getting to, even though the Lord, in a way, doesn't need anything and he really doesn't need me, he wants me. Mm -hmm. God wants, do you know God wants Divine you? The branches. Catholics know God really yeah. wants you and that he enjoys you expressing yourself to him to articulate that. And then it's just, you know, let's pray together. Can, can I just lead us in a prayer? And I find a lot of Catholics are really open to that. Once you, I mean, we can really pray and just, yeah, and just <laughs> sense the presence. It's just a beautiful thing. And, and that's part of the Catholic faith. I just think we need to pray more. We need to know how to pray spontaneously and just invite people to pray, to know the Jesus who's already in them. It's not that you don't have Jesus, you have Jesus. Yeah. Now, evangelical sometimes is like you don't have Jesus. Well, if you're baptized, you really do have Jesus. You know, you made a good point in that because often when we think about witnessing, we think about words. And then the other extreme is you see St. Francis's quote all the time in Catholic Church, you know, uh, evangelize often if necessary, use words. Right. And that's good, except right. that can be used to discourage us from using words. But what you're talking about is helping people experience Jesus yeah. through prayer. Right. You, you know, it, not just telling them about Jesus, but actually helping them experience him in an And this is the Catholic prayer. teaching great, and, and, and this is this is the key. It's conversion that in a way led me out and it's conversion that has led me back. And John Paul too, God's blessings continue upon him. And Benedict, they all say we must have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Well, you know, some people in the Catholic Church, well, what are you talking about? We have an encounter every time in, in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And we do. Yes. And we have encounter through baptism and so on. But 
But you know, there's ongoing in camps, there's ongoing conversions. We're saved, but we're being saved, and we shall be saved. You know, we become one flesh in marriage, but we're becoming one flesh, and we shall be one flesh. So this is ongoing process of conversion, and I think the Catholic Church would stop a lot of its bleeding if it just led its children uh, in personal conversion to Christ. All right, thank you, Jim. Let's take a break. Come back in a moment. With more of your questions for Jim Pinto. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is James Pinto. Thank you for answering the questions so far. We're gonna have, we've got a, a batch more waiting. Great. Before we go to the questions, though, uh, I just wanted to mention something for prayer. Uh, those of you that are following the news, there's all kinds of things that are happening, sometimes horrendous things happening, even in our schools that are uh, just beyond belief. And so we offer our prayers for all the families that have been affected, especially lately with the, the radical gunmen. You know, okay. Lord Jesus, have mercy. But we also want to mention uh, another issue for your prayer concern, especially for EWTN's family around the world. Late last week, a typhoon hit the Philippine city of Manila. It was labeled the worst typhoon to hit Metro Manila in a decade. And we ask for prayers tonight for all those people affected by the typhoon in the Philippines. Let's keep them in prayer. All right. All right, Jim. Uh, let's see, we have an email for you here. Let's go with um, this one from Joan from Pennsylvania. Dear Marcus and James, my question concerns confession. Mm -hmm. I have made my first confession in 30 plus years six months ago, but I am finding it difficult to return on a regular basis. As a Catholic reefer, can you give any advice on self-examination for a fulfilling reconciliation? Thanks and God bless. Great email, Joan. Mm. Well, it's interesting with the uh, Missionaries of the Gospel of Life, we do a monthly pro-life examination of conscience. And I think the Ten Commandments, just reading over the Ten Commandments, is really a wonderful thing to do. And uh, there are some uh, little brochures that take you through each of the commandments and ask particular questions so you can think it through. Um, so I think those things are helpful. But I think also, uh, you know, understanding more deeply uh, just the, the benefit of confession and the great promise of the Lord that as we confess our sins to him in the presence of the priest that you will hear the voice of Jesus Christ speaking to you absolution and remission of sin. This is an absolutely wonderful thing. It's not required that you go uh, unless there is mortal sin, uh, but uh, you know it's one of the things my wife and I enjoy so much <laughs> because to come with the sense of cleanliness, the sense of purity, the sense of accountability. So just know that this is a wonderful thing. This is a real opportunity to encounter Jesus Christ and uh, it's just a total win situation. So I think just the joy of it, make sure you're on the right page with it, and, and, and just know the sheer beauty of it, as well as doing that examination of conscience. All right, Jim, thank you. Let's go to Leslie from Texas. Hello, what's your question? Uh, hi, I just wanted to say something. Um, first, I have to say that I noticed that, uh, that every one of your guests really has to love the truth more than they love their own comfort level mm -hmm. <laughs> in order to convert. And I really thank the Lord for that and for the zealousness that you all bring into the church. Um, I have a, f a friend that was an Episcopal priest. Actually, he was an Anglican priest. And it turns out he's uh, gone over to the Episcopal church. He's a bishop now. And the Lord brought him to my mind not too long ago. And I hunted him down and called him. And I asked him if he, uh, as yet, had the wisdom to enter the Catholic Church. <laughs> and he laughed and told me no. But I'm wondering if you all have any advice <laughs> or, you know, just contact I might have with this man or any uh, anything besides obviously praying for him. All right. Well, thanks, Leslie. Well, prayer is actually one of the most important things because conversion happens by grace. Yes. So that's... Uh, I think it's good that he laughed and said yeah. no. <laughs> I mean, it shows that he yep. has, you know, a sense of humor about that and he wasn't particularly, you know, disturbed, although he's thinking. Well, it also shows that Leslie's doing the most important things in evangelization. That's relationship. Yeah. 
when she has a relationship with them that allows them to, to joke a little bit. Yeah, you've got to yeah, build the relationship. And, you know, God's writing a spiritual history for every human being, I believe. And sometimes you just can't see it, whether it's our children or whether it's other people we're concerned about. And sometimes I just pray, oh, Lord, I really do believe that you're writing a spiritual history for this person. And if the Catholic Church is, is, is the true church established by our Lord upon the rock of Peter, then it is God's heart, God's desire to bring people into fullness, that the Lord loves this man, this priest, more than any of us do. And so the Lord is with us, the Lord is, is on our side in that. And uh, it's just, just a matter of time we wait because the door will be opened, I believe, for everyone uh, before they lay their heads to rest permanently, that God's trying to reach them. And we can rest in that. And people need to know that we have that sense with us. I think one of the great things about being Catholic is it's a lot less uptight. You know, I, I think I felt more pressed as an evangelical and as a Pentecostal that I, I, I knew everything at that time, it seemed. And, and you become a, a Catholic, you really find out uh, that there, there are no experts wow. and that everybody is on a journey indeed. And you can just kind of relax with that. People sense that, that you're not pushing them. And, uh, you know, they may call on you at that, at that time. All right. Thank you, Jim. Let's go to Rashad from Florida, dear Jim and Marcus. As you both may know, the traditional Anglican communion is seeking union with Rome. Their bishop's council has voted unanimously to allow their primate to begin talks with Rome. How could Rome work this out? Will the TAC Anglicans be allowed to form their own right within the church akin to the Greek church? God bless Rashad from Florida. First of all, the, tr the TAC, do you know very much about that group? Or traditional Anglican oh, communion? Yeah, well, I don't know if there's just one or more than one. There's a number of traditional Anglican communions. And, and a number yeah. of the guys that, I mean, those what we would call high church who were in the Episcopal church uh, that really uh, were part of what was called, I guess, the Oxford movement yeah. and uh, really had a respect for apostolic succession and, and the authority of the Pope, although not under the Pope. So they're in that realm, and I, I hope that dialogues do continue to go on. And, and I'm sure that that Rome and dialogue and by the grace of the Holy Spirit will do the right thing. There is the possibility someday that there could be a right, an Anglican right. Right now there's an Anglican usage where they've taken the Book of Common Prayer and have done some things that that's not a right, yeah. so that can be used by some whole congregations that may right. come in. And so I think it's very important that there, there be yeah. dialogue, that we pray for wisdom, uh, because there's many, many fine men that yeah, can the be right. priests. See, the right refers to something that you know has right. uh, apostolic origins or something that's been along for a long time. So I don't. I, my own view is that it'd be, I can't imagine the church establishing You're a new right. right, but the usage, usage. and other things. Yeah. My other piece of advice, and I'm going to get some people mad at me for this, uh, uh, but we need to pray for th groups like this, the more traditional Anglican groups that are very um, liturgical, right. that consider themselves very Catholic already, mm -hmm. that sometimes mistakenly think that becoming Catholic will be very simple. I mean, we're right. almost identical. So they step over because sometimes it's it's like that warning Jesus gave to practice your piety before people that they may see you. We mm -hmm. can look great on the outside, right. but is there conversion on the inside? I mean, becoming a Catholic requires more than merely the external similarities. It requires true conversion on the inside. Right. It's a surrender. And sometimes I have found, I don't know if you found this, Jim, that those that come from radically different traditions into the Catholic Church are so humbled by what they had to give up and change and fight. And sometimes those that come into the church almost like stepping over a puddle right. don't quite appreciate what they've gained yeah. because it was so similar. Yeah. Well, I don't know too many that have stepped over it like a puddle. So, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> more, more with the... I mean, that wasn't the case for you. No, no, course, I had yeah. to really make a separation. I mean, if the Lord wants to restore a diaconal ministry or a priesthood ministry, it'd be very difficult, but I, I won't rule that out. But I really had to make a separation. And I think that's very important to say yeah. uh, the key is being a child of God. The key is being in the church that was established by the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that means I do not get to serve as a deacon or as a priest, then, then I have to be face to face with my Lord and be at peace and be his son. I just can't keep robbing his yeah. stuff and, and, and using it over here and picking and choosing. I have to submit even if that means losing everything here. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Kevin from Pennsylvania. Hello, Kevin. What's your question? Hello. First of all, I'd just like to say that my thoughts and prayers are with the children from Lancaster yeah. today. Yeah. Uh, and also, Jim, when you first felt the calling to become a priest, how old were you? And then how much stronger were those feelings to actually leave that calling to find your true service to, to God? 
Uh, my sense of being a priest, uh, there was something that happened at my conversion here in Alabama um, that something was starting within me and then began to pray, began to, to share with my own priest in the Episcopal Church and to test this out and then went off to seminary and while in seminary you know was still working through am I called to be a deacon, am I called to be a priest and really through my prayers, through counseling with others, through thinking through what priesthood is about, you know I really had a, a sense within me, right or wrong, that I was called to to be a priest. So it took, uh, it was really in my, my 20s where I had that call in the midst of conversion, then three years in seminary discerning this, you know, with, with a body of people, and then being ordained, uh, really thought through diaconal or priesthood, really felt like it should be the priesthood, really still have that same sense within me, but am totally willing to submit that to the church and just trust, uh, you know, all things uh, to the Lord. Yeah, all right, very good. Let's see, we have a couple emails here. Let's go, this one's from uh, Mark in Vermont. Hi, Marcus and James. Uh, what would be a good starting point for someone from an evangelical background to begin exploring the tenets of the Catholic faith? Any recommendations? Where do you begin? Well, you know, I, for me, uh, it was just wonderful, the catechism of the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that was one of the key things for me, and I had been a priest for a number of years in the Episcopal Church, and, and the new catechism came out, the one authorized by John Paul II, which is the official norm and standard for teaching you know, within the church. I mean, that, that's the boundaries, that's, that's the standard, John Paul II said. So I think get the new catechism of the Catholic Church, go over the four pillars of the church, how we worship, how we pray, how do we then live. There is so much uh, that, that is in there, so I think that would be the key resource, along with the Catholic Bible, yeah. with all the books of the scripture. I'm using the, the New Catholic Answer Bible, and this is wonderful because it has 88 different questions uh, to, to, that people pose about Catholicism. So you're reading through all the books, plus you have different teachings that are in here. And so I think you can go a long way with the Catholic Answer Bible, with the Catechism uh, of the Catholic Church, and I think those are the, the best resources that I know. Very good. You may want to go to EWTN.com. Look at all the resources that are available there to help you on the sure. journey. I mean, EWTN's put together a lot of good stuff. All right, phone, uh, let's see, Rudy from Florida. Hello, Rudy, what's your question? Good evening, Marcus and Jim. It's yeah. a great program tonight. Thanks, Drew. Uh, we are close to the midterm elections. I would like to vote for politicians who are totally pro-life, but sometimes it's not possible. If we have to make a choice between candidates who are not totally pro-life, how should we evaluate them? All right, Rudy, thanks a lot. Yeah, well, are I'm there any candidates that are totally pro-life? Well, I mean, who knows? You go over what is totally pro-life. Well, if we could speak about abortion, then there probably are some that are totally. You know, it goes into many different yeah. dimensions of pro-life. You know, yeah. you got the elderly, you got the handicapped, you got the poor, you got immigration. You got what is? But I think the, 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 you do look for candidates that um, uh, make a priority of the right to life. That is the priority that that human existence, the right to life. Everything else is built upon that. That is what the, the church has taught. Um, and I, I believe from my studies uh, that yes, you vote for the most pro-life candidate, I believe, as you can evaluate that, but there are times where somebody isn't pro-life and some people decide, well, I'm going to sit out if I can't vote totally pro-life. And, and I don't think the church recommends that. It doesn't say that. Uh, the church understands that it is possible in certain situations to vote for people that are not totally pro-life. You do the best you can with the candidates. You know, the candidates aren't the Pope of Rome. You're not looking for bishops and, and popes to be candidates. You just do the best you can to establish the culture of life in your city, in your state, in this nation as you can, but you start with the foundation being the right to life, and then I think you go to marriage, you go to the family and where they stand. But it is okay to vote for candidates that uh, aren't fully in those realms. You just gotta yeah. get the best candidate you can, and the church says, you can do that. It's not that you're voting for somebody who isn't totally pro-life, you're voting for the most pro-life candidate that you can vote for. Right. Very good. good. I mean, I, I, is there anyone that's perfectly pro-life? Is there anyone that's perfect? No, obviously not. We're all on right. a journey. We're all sinners. So, uh, yeah, but thanks for the guidelines. Very good. Let's go to the email from Valerie from Florida. Hello, Marcus and Jim. I came across a major evangelical leader on TV explaining on a blackboard the difference between, quote, Petra and Petros. Mm -hmm. He was explaining why there is no such thing as apostolic succession. I have to wonder what evangelicals make of the many centuries of Catholic tradition. We accept evangelicals to be Christian, but they don't accept Catholics to be Christian. 
Could you talk more about that? Sincerely, Valerie from Florida. Yeah. Well, that that's the uh, the critical thing, you know. Uh, thou art Peter, and, and upon this rock I will build my church. And uh, I think uh, the traditional teaching has been that he was speaking about building literally on Peter. And I think, uh, you know, this whole thing of Peter and rock and the changing of, I think it really should go back to the original language, which was probably uh, Aramaic or Hebrew. And, uh, and that, uh, you know, he was saying both things really, that yeah. it would be upon this kifa, I will build my kifa. And so it, it is Peter. I don't know how you get away from that historically. Uh, but for some people, they start from the Reformation on and kind of yeah. strange interpretations. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think uh, we have to remember sometimes where we've come from and that a lot of this really is is just not knowing, not having understanding, and people trying to be faithful to their tradition. Uh, yeah. and, and so there's some strange traditions out there, but that's, and, and some yeah. fairly good traditions. But you know, I often say that um, you know, we're all part of a church that's been divorced you know, for the last 500 years, you know, I wasn't a part of that. And many evangelicals and different denominations, they weren't a part of the original break. But they're growing up in traditions where they've been trained by their family members and they're trying to be obedient to their parents, to their traditions, to what they've learned. And they really, you know, think they're right. But it's just they don't have the information. And the catechetical teaching and everything else tries to understand that. And that's why dialogue is just so important and to, and to talk and to share and to ask the questions and to clear up these uh, misconceptions. That particular question about Petros and, and Petra, if you go to any of the more popular apologetic books that are out, whether it's been written by Carl Keating or Pat Madrid or Dave Armstrong or uh, the list goes on, almost all of them are available through EWTN Religious Catalog. Uh, you can go to the Coming Home Network International website, chnetwork.org. There's lots of places, but that's one of the key, on the one hand, weapons that non-Catholics will use to try and undercut Petrine authority, but they haven't done their homework. The right. homework is there. Right. It's easy to work that one through. Just go to any popular Catholic apologetics book and they'll deal with that issue. But thanks. It's a great email for us to be able to mention that. Thanks again. Let's go to Susan from Massachusetts. Hello, what's your question? Hi, Marcus and Jim. Thank you for taking yeah. my call. Um, about three years ago, I converted to the Catholic Church from the United Methodist Church. Welcome and back. when I was a Methodist, there were a lot of opportunities to fellowship with other Christians. Mm. There were opportunities for Bible study, and all of those things really encouraged my growth as a Christian. Since I've been a Catholic, I feel like I've been on my own in my faith journey. I, you know, I go to Mass and and go home and I read books, but I've had a very difficult time connecting with other Catholics. All right. I was wondering if you could... Um, Fine question, Susan. Yeah, okay. uh, and uh, you know, I host a little gathering at my house. We call it Journey to Fullness. And uh, what Joy and I are trying to do for people is to do what we wished was done for us. And just to say, if we hear of some people that have recently come in or are thinking about coming in, we just give them a, a safe place, a sanctuary to come, uh, that they could share, they could have some refreshments, maybe even some uh, kind of home worship, a spontaneous worship or some contemporary songs that they were used to. And yet this is a real lack. Um, and, and, and maybe the, the priorities are right within the Catholic Church because it's so much meeting Jesus in the sacrament and that's the, the source in some, and that's as it should be. But there are, but also, you know, there's the neo-catechumenal way now within the Catholic Church where there's, there's home masses, people gathering together. So yes, it really is needed. Let your pastor know about it. And I bet you'll find in your community some people that are coming together, that are gathering together. And uh, there are various groups that are beginning to meet now, like that Teen Life group and, and yeah. other groups. You know, I was just thinking about this. And I'm not sure if your background th this connects, but I was a Presbyterian pastor. Now the, pa the churches that I pastored always had lots of adult Bible studies and gather right. lots of things. But I knew of lots of Presbyterian churches that didn't have all that stuff. Yeah. And in many ways, if you went back 80 years, 90 years to most of the Protestant churches, they wouldn't have had all those things. They kind of grew during this evangelical yeah. revival. Now, a lot of times, those, those gatherings were started by the pastor. But more often than not, they were started by laymen and women in the church that wanted that fellowship. Right. And in the Catholic Church, we might be more used to, well, that's father or sister's right. job. But the reality is it begins with us. Absolutely. And I think uh, 
to this caller again. She just needs to know that you really are in a time in the church where lay ministry and uh, lay outreach is being emphasized in document after document. And so, you know, it might very well be that it's something that you'll wind up leading. Yep. And just keep it very simple and uh, let your pastor be in dialogue with your pastor, and I bet it'll bloom. In fact, I'll give you an example. My wife, Marilyn, uh, every other Wednesday has a small group of ladies that gather. And what they do is they go to Father Ben Rochelle's website, okay. the, uh, um, uh, oh, my mind just went blank now all of a sudden, the uh, uh, oratory, okay. the oratorydl.org, and there, there's a, a study already prepared. You can copy it off. It's great. It's available for you. The Missionaries of the Gospel of Life also have life cell groups where we have people together studying Evangelium Vitae and having fellowship together so you can contact us. Just imagine if a thousand Catholics this weekend invited three friends to get together, each one. We'd have 4,000 people gathering for a study and it would, it would explode. Yeah. Let's just Absolutely. do it. I mean, uh, don't wait for permission, just do it you know, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, let's go to this email. I think email or phone. We have lots of uh, stuff. Good evening. I know from Greg. I know many Catholics who married non-Catholics and decided to become Episcopalian as a compromise. Is this a common occurrence? And what are your thoughts on it? God bless you both, Greg. Thanks for the email. It is a, a common occurrence, and uh, you know I would say to those who are Catholic, uh, you know they really need to hold their hold their ground, understand your faith, really take time, and, and that, uh, you know, if there's any cross-marrying, it needs to be Episcopalians crossing over into the Catholic Church, uh, because that's the fullness of the faith, uh, the most sound teaching in terms of the sacredness of, of human life, uh, in terms of sexual relationships, fullness there. And uh, so, yeah, this is, this is often done, but I, I don't think it's that often done by Catholics that really know their faith. I was going to say, because it really isn't a compromise in, it, in a mm, way, when you say that yeah. when that occurrence happens, it, it expresses the fact that neither the Catholic or the non-Catholic either understood or appreciated their faith very well in the first place. They're looking for common ground, but right. they didn't understand their faith well enough to not want to leave it, you know, That's or right. to want to stick to their faith. So we've got to know our faith. Uh, Peter says, give a reason for the hope that's in us. You know, we need to know our faith. I think we've got to see, we've got another email, another call coming. Let's see our next caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Are you there? Norman. Hello, is this Norman? Yes. Hello, Norman. Where are you calling from? And what's uh, your Wisconsin. Question? Great. What's your question? I have a question for Jim Pinto. Uh, the Anglican Church was founded by Henry VIII, who was an adulterer, a murderer, a despot, tyrant, and psychopath. And I'm wondering if you, during your seminary training they discussed that at all, and if so, why didn't you run away as fast as you could? <laughs> Thank you. Well, other than that, I heard he was a pretty nice guy. <laughs> 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 so you focus on the good side. <laughs> That's what you do in Anglican. Uh, no, I think uh, <laughs> the, the key thing that was, was taught was, uh, especially in an Anglican evangelical seminary, that it was a blending of, of politics and of religion that there was uh, an undercurrent that needed to take place of reformation, uh, that the, the Catholics were not giving the scriptures uh, to the people. Uh, there was Wycliffe, uh, there was Luther, and uh, so, so there was this undercurrent, and you were allowed right. to have the scriptures, the priesthood of all believers. This is really a good thing. King Henry VIII wasn't a good guy. I mean, that, that was there in Anglicanism, but in, in a mysterious way, he was actually used to restore the Word of God, to give the Word of God to the people. Now that's what's called Elizabethan history. Yeah. In other words, you were, you were kind of given a, a myth yeah. because the church wasn't in need of that kind of reform at the time. Right. And so, yeah. so in other words, in a sense, like many, you know, my tradition came from the Lutheran Calvin tradition, and many of us, our history stopped with the Reformation. We go back, well, in a sense, Anglican history for many Anglicans goes back to Elizabeth. Right? That's I mean, right. it really doesn't examine the Reformation itself. Right. And uh, I might use that for a little uh, commercial here. I didn't plan to do that, but the Coming Home Network is having their uh, annual conference the first week in November on the English Reformation. Wonderful. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can go to deepinhistory.com. Thank you very much. Um, Jim, thank you for joining us. One more time as we close. Yes. A couple, couple seconds. Okay. Tell them more about what you're doing and how they can contact you. The Missionaries of the Gospel of Life, Lay Association, uh, is 
is going to be used, I believe, by God to lead one of the greatest mobilizations of lay people that has ever happened in the history of the church. Mm. Uh, it's already in the hearts of, I believe, millions of people uh, to go forth, and our call is that every Catholic is called to be a missionary of human dignity, and you're sent into this world to evangelize. If you're interested, please contact us. We'd love to sign you up. Website again? Uh, priestforlife.org slash missionary. All right, Jim, it's great to have you back. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you very much. Enjoyed God it. bless you in your work. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. Thank you for your prayers. We're, we're, we're in this together, and we're supporting each other in prayer that God's grace might help us to grow stronger in Jesus Christ. Thank you.